We've all been there. You decide that today is the day you want to declutter and you pull everything out of your cupboards and then are faced with piles of stuff with no order whatsoever. And you think to yourself, what on earth have I done? And then because of the overwhelm, you leave the room, you close the door, and you don't come back for days. This is what we call the messy middle. And in this podcast, we'd love to tell you how to avoid that. You're listening to the Declutter Hub podcast, bringing you tried and tested, no-nonsense tips and advice from the leading experts in decluttering and organizing your home. Now, here are your hosts, Ingrid Janssen and Leslie Spellman. Hello and welcome listeners. I'm Ingrid. And I'm Leslie. If you're new to the Declutter Hub podcast, you're so welcome. What you'll find is that we try and find a fun factor in the serious business of decluttering. And if you've been here for a while, you know exactly what we mean. So thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get involved in conversations relating to this podcast, it all takes place in our Facebook group. So come and join our lovely, warm, supportive community. To find the Facebook group, go to declutterhub.com forward slash group to find out more or you can search for the Declutter Hub community on Facebook. Well, Leslie, the messy middle. Oh, my words. How many times have we seen it happen? I know, exactly. It's a biggie, isn't it? It's like a, it's just something that happens all the time. There's actually like Facebook funnies about it, isn't there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like where it's like, what have I done? What have I done? Because you get kind of over-enthusiastic, don't you? And you sort of go, yeah, yeah, this is what I did then. I'm just going to pull everything out of those cupboards and then I'm going to sort it all out. And it's a surefire way to be completely overwhelmed, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And it doesn't matter which room it is. You know, it can be wardrobes. It can be pulling everything out of your food cupboards. It can be, oh, just a random cupboard somewhere. And let me just pull everything out and see what's under there. And then it's like how is it even possible that so much stuff is fit in this cupboard or wardrobe? I didn't even know how much, how much was in there. I know. I think that's it. If it's not, if it's something that you're not well practiced at, it's an easy mistake to make, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's something that certainly, you know, I remember when I first started out as a professional organizer, I kind of did something quite similar really where I, where I just kind of dragged everything out. And then I was like, Ooh, <laughs> I mean, this was, like, I can, I can still remember my first client really vividly and just, it was complete chaos. And I think we really stand behind process and order and control, don't we, Ingrid? And so whether that's the decision-making process or whether that's the logistic, logistical, is it? Logistical. We are all about process and order, aren't we? And having a kind of controlled journey. And I think whether that's the decision-making process or whether that's how you do it logistically, then I think you need to feel 100% in control all of the time. It's hard enough having to do, make all the decisions and all that, but we need an orderly environment in order to be able to do our best work, don't we? So what we wanted to talk about today was indeed the messy middle, which scares people off running for the hills, never to return to a decluttering project. So what can we do to avoid the messy middle? We're going to talk about before you even get started on a decluttering project or when you about to get started what kind of practical things can you put in place to avoid that we're going to talk about how it all unfolds in the messy middle because it's it can you avoid it completely can everything be super controlled probably not so we're going to talk about the middle bit of it and then we're going to talk about what you do towards the end of a project to make sure that if you have to return to the project that you're all set up for success for tomorrow or whenever you come back to it right well, it sounds easy, Leslie. <laughs> but not like it. it's not. No, it's not. So I think we really need to dive in and uh, and give people some good advice. Give our listeners some good advice because, oh boy, oh boy, that that messy middle is is tricky to avoid. And you know, you do at one point always look around a little bit and go, "Wow, it looks messier here than it was before." But if you do it in a structured way, you know 
it's just a bit of a hill you need to climb and you can go back to being more orderly later. But yeah, there's always a bit of a chaos and mess involved when you're decluttering and organizing. Do you know what I've just been thinking about? Because we've always said, and we've talked about this before, that we would never, we don't think that you and I working together would work well, you know, it, with a client in a home, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I think we would maybe kill each other, actually. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're the other side of a computer generally, aren't we? Yeah, I just don't know whether we do, because I don't think we do things in the same way at all. We don't think in the same way. So I would imagine that my messy middle, even though it's not messy, is messier than your messy middle. <laughs> That's the, that's the conclusion that I've come to. <laughs> My version of a controlled kind of environment and yours are probably very, very different. <laughs> I never thought about it this way, but you're probably right, Leslie. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, that's good enough. That's good enough. And you'd be like, no, we need to cross the I's and dot the T's before we continue. Yeah. But anyway, so it's not really about us. It's about everybody else. So we've got a good handle on what the messy middle is. Let's give an, give an example. Now, everyone's probably got one of those big sort of catch-all cupboards, and there might be a bit of stationery in there, a bit of crockery in there, maybe some craft stuff in there, some school books, a bit of shoe polish. It could be anything in there, right? but it's just a big cupboard with lots of different types of things in it. The last thing that we need to do at this stage is pull everything out of the cupboard all at one go. Otherwise it's completely chaotic and overwhelming and difficult to see the wood for the trees, right Ingrid? So how do we go about doing something like that? How do we avoid the chaos that we're talking about? Well, I think it starts already, Leslie, before you even start pulling stuff out, you need to have a bit of a setup. And what do we mean with that? You need to already have a bin bag ready where you know if I found some rubbish, I'm going to put it in a bin bag. I would also have a bag ready for recycling, whether that's a kind of a, maybe a see-through bin bag or maybe a, a box or something where if you find something that needs to be recycled, like cardboard or anything like that, that you can already put it in there. So you need to think about, okay, what kind of things am I going to find and how am I going to tackle this project and not just go, right, okay, I'm ready to do this cupboard open the doors and start pulling stuff out just randomly from this cupboard. You need to think about your setup and go, okay, what can I expect? I can expect rubbish. I can expect recycling. I can maybe expect um, to find some things that need to go to other rooms. So let me create a bag for that so I can have something to carry it around with. Um, let me sure, maybe, you know, if you're starting a bit later in the days, will it be a bit darker? Do I need to have some extra lights? Do I need to, or maybe need to open the curtains to create some light in? So to kind of make the space a bit inviting for you to work with. Yeah, and the very important thing that you've not even mentioned, Ingrid, is to try and get something for donations, right? And so hopefully most of this stuff is going to be able to be donated. Now, um, I'm not sure how you do it when you're working with Organize Your House, but certainly as the Clutter Fairy, we... We definitely have different color bin bags for different things. And so we're obviously going through big volumes of stuff. Perhaps, a little, you know, when we're working with a client, you know, we get through quite a lot of stuff in a day typically. So we need to have a good handle on what's going where. And I, th I think that really helps the feeling of control. So Ingrid was talking about a different bag for recycling. So for us, we use black for like actual rubbish or trash or whatever we use um clear see-through stuff for donations so that the um thrift shop charity shop whatever can see exactly what's coming in um we use heavy sort of like those heavy duty sacks like you can use that you can use them for they're like diy sacks they're called here or you can use garden sacks as well for things like paper and cardboard um and so, and then we use red for stuff that is going to be given to somebody else as well. So we've got four different color bags that we've used. We're not suggesting that you need to go out there and buy four different color bin bags, because actually from a normal supermarket, it's not that easy to get four different colors. But what is readily available is DIY sacks, um, garden sacks, which are typically green that you can use potentially for your donations and black bin liners. Those are readily available in every supermarket. Other stuff is available online um, if you want to go down that route, but don't overcomplicate it. We've mm -hmm. obviously got big volume, so we're using hundreds of bin bags 
um, every month and stuff. But it's useful to know what's in each bin bag because if you put everything into a black bin liner, you're like, oh, was that the donations? And was that the what was that the recycling? Which was it? And you lose control. And I think it's then important, yeah. isn't it, Ingrid, to feel that control? Yeah, absolutely. I use three colors as well in DLS. The black is rubbish. Um, the heavy DIY is normally for recycling and paper and things like that. And the green I use for donations. So I, because I like them there, because they're normally a bit sturdier, but if I've got a lot of crockery and ornaments, then I would see, can we maybe use an empty box that the client has in their house, or maybe that's not broken down yet for recycling to, to put stuff like that in there. And you can kind of then carry it a little bit safer. So yeah, just have a little bit of a plan. Don't just randomly pull everything out. And it's also really nice, Leslie, to just use some label something. So put a sticker on there, you know, if, so if you don't have all these different colors and you're like, oh, I'm going to be confused. Put a label on there or a sticker on there saying, this is rubbish, this is recycling, this is donation, this is to go back to a friend, this is to go to another part in the house. So you have a really, really good overview of what is going in what. Yeah, because we're all about breaking things down into manageable chunks, right, Ingrid? So when we talk about us working with clients, you know, typically we would get through one room in a day or in a session. Um, sometimes if it's a little bit more full, we don't. But we need to think about the fact that we might have to to stop that session at some point during the day and return to it. Yeah. That's another reason. And with the best will in the world, we forget where we got to. And so as well as having things labeled up on your bin bags and things like that, or having labels ready to put on your bin bags, it's useful to have some kind of boxes, typically that might be able to stack. That's also quite useful. Um, so that you can kind of, you can like lay them out while you're working, while you're gathering light with like and making decisions about things. But then at the end of the day, you can kind of try and return your room back to normal by stacking these boxes um, vertically upwards. And so we love a collapsible crate, don't we, Ingrid, to kind of, you know, to gather light with like, and then, you know, you can put on it. So I, I just use a little postcard over the handle of the collapsible crate or over the edge of the box to say, this is what it is. And, you know, yeah. and then you can keep on adding to it. That's the thing, you know, you can keep on adding things too. So you've got to, before you even start to take things out, you've got to think about your process. It's so important, isn't it? So the planning, what am I going to do? What categories am I going to think about? We talk a lot about goals, you know, what's your goal for the day? Have I got the equipment that I need for success? Like the last thing you want to do is pull everything out and think, oh gosh, now I need a bin bag and I need some cleaning stuff. So gather all that sort of stuff together before you get started. So we talked about bin bags and we've talked about getting boxes to sort into. And we've talked about having sort of temporary boxes. You know, the problem with a lot of uh, rooms, Ingrid, where and when we we're working in quite full houses is that often the containers are, I've already got stuff in them, right? So um, so you might want to kind of amalgamate a couple of things to create some free boxes if you've got them, if you haven't got any at the moment, you know, so amalgamate two things together and you'll come back to them at some point. So yeah, so we were all set up. How are we going to put our boxes or bags or whatever we're going to sort into? What do you typically do, Ingrid? Well, I try to always, <laughs> if a room is quite full, Leslie, I just first try to create a bit of space so I can actually move myself. You know, if if the the door of the room can even hardly open, then I probably have to kind of wriggle myself in and kind of try to get some maybe cardboard boxes and things that are empty out first. So I can actually have room to open a door so I can actually, I can go in and the client can go in. And then I normally try to kind of jet carefully stack some stuff so I create a place where I can work, whether it's on the floor or on the bed or on a table. But you need to have a little bit of room because if you need to constantly step over things, it's that's that's dangerous and you can damage things. And of course, you can trip over things. So it's really important to create some room to move. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the ideal scenario is that you can put like 10 collapsible crates or bags for life or whatever you're going to, cardboard boxes, whatever you're going to sort into, all nicely next to each other and you can just move around. But that's not always possible logistically, is it? Yeah. I think, you know, just think about the process of how are you actually going to, you know, look at the things that you're going to keep, how are you actually, where are you going to put them? And is it easy for you to get access to those so you know those are actually a designated area for things that you're going to keep? So... Okay, so we've thought about that. We've got bags, 
bags, we've got boxes, we've thought about what we're going to do. The main thing is that you don't, if you've got one of those kind of catch-all cupboards that we're talking about, don't drag out all your photo albums, all your books, all your stationery, all your shoe polishes, blah, blah. Don't do all of that. See if there is some kind of category in there already, try and stick with those categories. Of course, there are going to be things that have kind of got a little bit wayward, but try and go kind of one category at a time, right, Ingrid? Yes, I think so. I mean, you know, if you're um, working with a catch-all area, it's really important to put like with like. I think that's crucial because then you can get a really good overview on, okay, what is going on here? So if you've got, um, I don't know, uh, a cupboard in your living room and you're like, okay, everything is in there. Just label one of the crates or boxes. This is where all my notebooks and, and, and writing stuff goes into. And every time you find a notebook or a, or anything like that, in the box it goes. Then you create a separate one for stationery. So every time you find staplers and scissors and pens and all of those random bits in a crate together, then maybe you've got maybe in your living room some DVDs or CDs or whatever. Create a box where you put music or TV and put things together. And then we start to spot them in different areas. And you can really put like with like. The categorization is crucial. Yeah, again, to keep that control that we're talking yeah. about, we need you know, the whole process at this point is actually trying to gather light with like and keep things together. So you've got a good handle on what you've got and what the volumes are, that they're all together, that they're sorted or not sorted. I mean, let's go to a break, Ingrid, and then let's come back and let's talk about the process of deciding what you're going to yeah. keep and what you're going to let go of and where that fits in. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are talking about the messy middle and we're, we're actually in the middle of talking about it, aren't we, Leslie? <laughs> yeah, we're in the messy middle of the podcast. This yes. moment in time. Always gets messy in the middle, doesn't it, Ingrid? Um, I think we've really got to think about how do we make decisions and what do we do with the stuff? This is where the real messy middle bit kicks in. And so ideally you pick an item out of the cupboard you know it depends on how you've done it you might have pulled everything out and put it into a box and you've got everything together and you can work through the box like that you might be making decisions as you take things out of the cupboard before you gather light with light but ideally this is a decluttering exercise and so what we want to do is we want to make a decision about something whether it's a yes or a no, whether you're going to let it go, or whether you're going to keep it, and you need to put it straight where it's going. So that's either going to go into the keep box, categorized ideally, or it's going to go into donation if you're going to donate it, or it's going to go into rubbish or recycling. And so you need to start doing that now. So the, you've got to really put these things where they're going to go. So what you don't do is take it out and put it to one side and think, oh, I'm going to worry about that later. What you need to do is with every item that you get to, you make a decision on it there and then. The only exception to that is things like clothes. If you're, you've are you decided that you're going to do a trying on session, which we would highly recommend, you don't really want to try things on in the middle of your decluttering project. You can it depends. Sometimes it's a good idea to do that. And sometimes it's a good idea to do a full trying on session at the end for things that you're not sure about. But I think it's so important that you've made a decision that you are going to make that decision straight away. And you're going to go with your gut reaction. You're going to try and push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone. And you're going to make sure that the things that are kept are going one place, the things that are being donated are going to another place. So, so important. Don't have a kind of, oh, I'm not sure about that. Pick it up. Oh, I don't know, just put it on the floor. And then I don't know whether it's going to go in the donate or whether it's going to get the kit. That's where the messy middle comes from, right, Ingrid? Make a decision. Even if you gather like with like as you go along, you've still got the opportunity to return back to that and go, let me have another little look at that gathered like with like stuff yeah. and do a kind of almost a second pass on it. So if you know that it's going to go, it goes straight into a donation bin bag. So a lot of people, what we find is, they kind of don't think about the bin bag thing at the beginning. They kind of keep things to one side in a big pile. And then they're like, and then, go, oh, did I sort that? Where, where was that stuff from? Oh, I'm not sure. Then I'm going to have to go. And then it just stays there. It, that's where it's messy, right? Yeah. Make concrete decisions as you're working. This is yeah. not something to procrastinate over. Yeah. It, it, this is absolutely true, Leslie, what you're saying. Because I think when you take something out, 
you need to follow your you know, follow your gut feeling as well. You know when something is recycling. You know if it's an empty toilet roll. You know you know it's going to go into recycling. If it's broken, you know ninety nine out of hundred it's broken it needs to be thrown. When you're like, oh, it's actually something that I don't want anymore. I can donate it, go straight in. But then what happens with the keep stuff is that the people go, okay, I want to keep it, and they put it in one pile of all the stuff they want to keep, and they don't subcategorize it into their different categories like with like and then what happens you get this massive heap of stuff that then needs to be sorted out again yeah because people want to keep a lot of stuff of course you know we can't go overnight to a minimalist house so people are like oh, but i want to really keep that because what is so important about putting like with like and that subcategorization is that at one point you get to realization oh wow I actually do have a lot of notebooks and you don't know that when you're when you're trying to go through your cupboard, you're like, oh, you got a couple of notebooks. But then you suddenly find out you've got 37 notebooks and you're like, and they're all together in a box or in a crate. You're like, I had no idea. And then you can do a second pass on those notebooks and go, hold on a minute. This is far too many. I don't need this many in my house. Let me now look through this category and declutter some more. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of, they they just decide, okay, I'm just going to keep it and keep it and keep it. But they don't then put a structure in place on putting them all together. So in, in the, with the idea to go through them again at some point, and then it all kind of gets shoved in because then it feels really overwhelming with this whole heap of random stuff all again in one big pile. And then it's like, yeah, but I'm really tired now and I've done all this already. Ah, let me just put it back quick in the cupboard. And then it all gets put back in a completely chaotic way, which then doesn't help because then you know you've got things, but you still can't find them. I know. So the key is categorizing the stuff that you're keeping and categorizing the stuff that's going because the stuff that's going has got as many categories as the stuff that that you're keeping because it could be given to somebody else recycled thrown in the bin gone to the charity shop gone to a different charity gone upstairs to your son's bedroom gone to the kitchen so there can be several categories of things that need to be relocated or rehoused out of that actual room as well so don't procrastinate on the decision don't go oh it's like when we, we see it's like keep go donate you know like all the, it's like way too simplistic you see it on like on socials don't you have a yeah. keep box have a donate box have a to go box and it's like but you need like loads of different categories it's not as simple as keep put it in a box donate put it in a box I mean the donation a little bit more perhaps simple because hopefully if you've got one charity shop they'll take everything then it can all go in one box. But even the recycling and the trash has to be changed. You know, glass got to go somewhere, paper's got to go somewhere. Then you've got things like books, which involves something else because it's not going to go in a normal bin bag. And it's all, you know, and it all needs to be thought through at the beginning so you avoid this messy middle and you know exactly where you're up to. Talking about not procrastinating on decisions, Ingrid, let's talk about the look at later not able to make a decision just yet box what are we thinking about that yeah well i mean i think that is something that we can completely get on a soapbox about leslie we just don't like those boxes we don't like the maybe things you either keep it or you don't and actually from you know people who've listened to us at the, the podcast at the beginning of the year and at the end of last year we know we have the mantra if in doubt, keep it. Or if in doubt, don't throw it out. And I think that is really important. If you're uncertain about something, you put it in the keep box because you will go through that category of items again. And you might then change your mind, maybe not that day, but maybe two months later or two weeks later. But if you're unsure, don't just, and that doesn't mean you can Keep every unsure item that you've ever had in your house. You have to, like, let's just said, step out of your comfort zone on a regular basis and kind of go, I know, I'm not sure, but you know what? I, you, I'm you, making this decision with the best intentions with my what, what my current life and my, my future life will hold for me. But if you're really, really struggling, 
keep it. You will be able to make a decision that sits better with you later. Yes, absolutely. So, okay, so we've done our preparation. We're in the middle of our kind of, we're in the right in the messy middle, trying to make decisions, trying to move these things into what potentially might be 10 or 15 different places, different categories of stuff to keep, different categories of stuff to go, um, different categories to relocate for different rooms. There's lots of different areas. This is why we need to keep control of this. And then we go, oh, I'm a bit tired now. I've kind of done for today. You know, yeah. we need to recognize fatigue, whether that's physical fatigue or whether that's decision fatigue. We're done with making decisions for day because today, because if we think about it, every single decision that we make, every single item that we come across needs a decision. And even if that's just to keep or to put it in one of the 15 categories that we've got, it kind of takes emotional energy and we need to recognize that. So when we've got tired, when we get tired of doing this job, we need to make sure that we can return back to it fully in control of where we got to today. So we need to, you know, and for different people, that's going to mean different things. Some people like to take notes about it. Some people can put labels on things. You know, you might need to do a little bit of tidying up. I would definitely advocate, you know, if you have got a decent amount that the charity stuff or the donation stuff goes out of the room and ready to go to its next destination, can do you know a massive advocates of if you're doing a big decluttering job going to the to the don to donate these things to charity shop on the day incorporate that within your decluttering session if you're going out to the shops to pick your kids up whatever try and do a little rerun and just take it even if it's only one bag it's out of your house and out of your kind of vision and so it's so important to do that we do it every single day so when we're working with a client Every single session that we do involves a charity shop run at the end of it. It's a non-negotiable for us because it's important to see that project through to its end. Now, if you're in the middle of something and you've or you've only done 15 minutes or 30 minutes because that's all that you can manage for today, that's fine. So you're not going to bob off to the charity shop with two things every time because that doesn't make sense either. But you need to kind of have a bit of a plan as to where that's going to go. So how do we then prepare for the next phase in this project, Ingrid? Yeah, I think I think it's really important that at the end of a little decluttering project, little task that you've been doing, have a couple of minutes of tidying up time. And indeed, you know, get the stuff off the floor, get the recycling out, put it outside of your recycling bin, get the bag with rubbish out, move the indeed the don the items to be donated to your donation station or straight into your car to be donated on the next time you're going out to, to the to the shops and you're you're passing the goodwill or the charity shop. I think that that is really a part that a lot of people forget. They're tired, they down tools and they walk out of the room without just going, hold on a minute, let me just spend a couple of minutes just tidying it up here, <clears throat> putting a label on the crates that on, on the box that we create, or have a Sharpie at hand, if you're working with, I don't know, empty Amazon boxes, have a Sharpie at hand and go, this is stationary, this is music equipment, these are bits of toys that I found, these are board games, this is wrapping paper and and gift tags and cards. I mean, I mean, you, the, the random, the item, but write a couple of notes or use some extra sticky post-it notes or use a label or a sticker. So you don't have to think the next time you come back, which is maybe a couple of hours later or the next day or three days later. Oh, what was I doing here? What was going, what's going on here? What was this? You know, and if, you're, if your bin bag for the rubbish is absolutely full, this is the moment to take it, carry it out and put it outside in your in your bins. Don't leave it in that room and have already maybe even put an, a next empty uh, bin bag there ready for next time. So you don't have to kind of go, you go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. And you'll save yourself a lot of time. I think as well, you know, one of the things that we're big advocates as well of Ingrid is you know, leaving paperwork, for example, to later in the process or sentimental stuff later in the process. And yeah. so what we sort of say is if you find things that are going to be difficult while you're decluttering something that's less difficult, I mean, not that anything's easy, but sentimental and paperwork are great examples of that. 
don't spend the time now trying to make those tough decisions. So what we would advocate is if you find paperwork while you're decluttering, just put it into a box and don't worry about it and deal with it all together later. But sometimes there might be things that you need to you need to look at that and you need to go, I need to make it clear on this paperwork because obviously it's paperwork, but has it been sorted? Has it been looked through? Is it recycling? So for example, you know, you might keep one box full of shredding that you can do later. It needs to be very clear that that has been sorted and is ready for shredding, for example. So it's not just here's the categories. It's also if you've got bigger volumes, that's a sorted box or that's a box for recycling or whatever that might be. So make it clear whether or not you've already gone through it. Cause sometimes you can lose track of that as well. Yeah. And we all forget, don't we forget things. So it's all about, you know, preparing for that next session, because if you go into a room that's completely overwhelmed and chaotic, you're going to want to walk out before you've even begun, you know? So the first session we were like, let's get to go. Let's get the bin bags. Let's get the boxes. Then we started to gather. We didn't tidy up after the se session you know, we walked out the room because we were a bit tired and then we go back in and we're like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's way too hard. And then you walk back out again. And that's when we struggle to gather momentum and keep that momentum going on our decluttering journey, right? Yeah. Anything else that you want to add, Ingrid, to the messy <sighs> middle? I feel like I want to be in the middle of a decluttering. I feel in my head now I'm like, oh, I'd love to do like a catch-all cupboard, you know what I mean? And just I get know. stuck in and have crates and labels and sorting and... But I know. Oh, we're just sat here recording podcasts, which is equally nice. <laughs> we can't really get stuck in, can we? I know. It, you know, it's it's so satisfying, isn't it? I mean, even I mean, that's I think one of my favorite bits of decluttering is that even just to see the categories appear and go, see, now this can go together with this one. And that and it's like so satisfying because you already know that you're so much further ahead, just having like with like things together. So you can actually make you know, a decision over over the things that you think, oh, at first they're like the clients, like, oh, I want to keep everything. And then they're like, actually, no, I don't. I can declutter more. And I, oh, it's, I love it. Yeah. I know. So in summary, the important things are to prepare before you go in for battle, let's call it that, <laughs> to make sure that the middle part of it is controlled and that as you're sorting things out, you categorize into you know, like with like and the things that you're keeping, you keep that very heavily labeled and you also send the stuff that you're chosen to donate to that to their own individual categories of donation, recycling, garbage, whatever that might be. And then even if you get really tired, in the same way that we advocate doing evening resets, same principle, push yourself to do five or 10 minutes at the end of a session so the next time you go into it, it feels calm before you get started. Yeah. And absolutely do not pull everything out at once. Go category by category or section by section or small manageable chunk. You know, it might not even be categorized in your cupboard, but only take it one step at a time, then sort that out, categorize it all, and then go, okay, I'm ready for another pile. Okay, I'm ready for another pile. You know, we just see, and particularly in bedrooms and stuff, I'm seeing where people pull everything out of every cupboard and every drawer because there's no order in it to start off with and think, well, I've got to put it into order. But it's still good to put things into order in smaller chunks than it is to do everything. You know, this, this principle of trying to get all of your clothes out and put them on the bed. How overwhelming is that? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? People have got hundreds of items of clothes, you know, and, and if it takes a couple of minutes to make decisions, I mean, how much time is that? You know, we we don't do that. We go one section at a time in wardrobes, don't we, Ingrid? You know, because yeah. it, it's important to keep it manageable so that it doesn't become, you know, emotionally overwhelming. And yeah. so... Oh, we could talk all day about the messy middle, couldn't we? I know, I know. And I would love to know from you listeners, have you ever fallen foul of the messy middle? Do you have shivers down your spine well, you, when you heard us talking about this and going, yeah, I've been there, I feel it, I know. And do you think our tips have helped you to avoid this messy middle and feel more in control? We would love to hear from you. Leave a comment in our YouTube channel. That's where you can listen and watch to our podcast as well. In the comment section, let us know if, if this was helpful for you. We would love to know, don't we, Leslie? I do love to know. And of course, you can leave comments on our website as well. Yep. You will be talking about this in the Facebook group. So you can put comments on, you know, we have various posts about what's happening on the Facebook group. So 
We want to hear from you. We do way too much talking, Ryan Grid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people hopefully enjoyed because, I mean, this is podcast 281, Leslie. So, yes, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening in week in, week out. And, um, yeah, we appreciate you. So hope to see you next week. Thanks so much for listening to the Declutter Hub podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to us in your podcast player so you don't miss an episode and we'll see you next week.